So thanks everyone for coming. Um, we are going to show you today really cool research we did in our company. We are from CyberX, a cyber industrial company. Um, and I'm David, and this is Gosha. Hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so I'm the VP research of CyberX. I've been in the IDF, in the IDF CERT. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing there a lot of malware research and reverse engineering. Gosha, give a few words about you. Uh, my name is George. I'm also, I also served in the IDF, in the Intelligence Corps, and I'm a security researcher at CyberX. And another guy who is not here, uh, his name is Stal. He was part of the research. He's uh, our machine learning researcher in CyberX, and he's doing a lot of work about modeling ICS behavior. So what, what we're going to, to talk about today, it's first we're going to take um, the view of an attacker and see how you can get inside OT networks. Um, after that, we'll talk about the challenges of exfiltrating the data once you're there already. And we're going to show how we did it, our new way of doing it. So. Um, we're talking about OT networks, but we're not OT networks for um, someone, for those who don't know what's OT networks. OT networks are operational networks, um, sometimes called SCADA networks. Um, it's basically um, networks inside like a factory or a power plant or anything that produces something. And they are usually consist of controllers and HMIs, which control the controllers. And um, these networks are really critical networks because if you harm, harm them, you probably stop the process, you stop the producing of a factory or producing of electricity, like we've seen that happened before in the recent, uh, it's not recent attacks, but in previous attacks it happened before. So. If an attacker wants to get inside an OT network, um, first of all, that's like um, it's like really general way to describe OT network and IT network. But usually, if they will be connected, they will be connected using a one-way diode, something that passes only stuff from the OT network to the IT network. It's usually done because um, think about it: you're monitoring some process in your operational network. Uh, like um, uh, producing some product and you want all the data to be available on your IT network to make reports and make uh, like statistics or something. So it would probably be connected using one-way connection. And getting to OT networks, it's, it's a challenge, but it's not impossible. And getting out of the OT networks, um, like getting the data out of the OT network, is also a challenge, but also not impossible. And when, once you're getting into an OT network, um, probably um, it's, think about it, if you're getting into an IT network as an attacker, you'll probably have some generic stuff like some uh, PCs, like uh, Windows computers, Linux computers, and you already have um, probably most of the data to attack the network. But when we're talking about operational networks, operational networks are very diverse. There are a lot of vendors, different vendors, different devices. If you want to harm some device, you need to understand what's the significance, the significance of the device inside the network. That means if you are just, I don't know, harming the controller that um, controls the, um, I don't know, the, the work lock of the workers, it probably some, some way harm the, the factory, but it won't stop its production. So the first stage before um, even attacking, destroying OT networks, making some harm, you have to collect all the data about the network. You have to get uh, all the devices that are there. You, get, you have to get 
um, the mapping of the network, which security products are there because you don't want to get caught. Um, you need to get the device type and the firmwares because sometimes controllers will act differently. Uh, even the same vendor have different, different types of the protocol for different versions of the controller. So, um, and the other things, you probably need the programs themselves, the ladder logic. Ladder logic is program that runs on the controller and um, controls its, um, um, its main logic. Um, which is usually think um, think about a controller as a smart um, smart electricity circuit which receives input from one side from sensors or something, and from the other side it produces um, some commands to do something. For example, if we have an oven that cooks something, and we have a heat sensor, um, if it goes too much hot, it will probably say the oven stop, stop producing heat. So um, all this logic that says that takes data from the sensor and take and says the oven stop producing heat is usually written in ladder logic. Also, you have to get the schematics and the designs of the factory to find which PLCs does what because. Um, for example, in the attack in Ukraine last year, um, they found out there's a, a protection relay that once he detects that something goes wrong, he switches to a backup plan. And they knew exactly to, um, to execute a denial of service vulnerability on that device because they knew its importance, they knew how it's important. And... Um, you need to get, of course, patterns of how the users are working and stuff like that. So what are the main attack vectors? Probably it will surprise you because uh, it seems like really simple attack vectors, but um, it's because the nature of OT networks, they're usually um, very um, outdated. Their firmware versions or their Windows versions are not patched. They are using Windows XP. We have seen Windows 2000 on some of our customers, and um, probably the the old attacks are going to work. So, uh, first attack vector is a malicious USB. Um, once you get a malicious USB to OT network, you can infect the network. Stuff like autorun inf, which is like basically autorun on the USB. It's enabled by default on Windows XP and probably work in most OT networks. Um, LNK exploits, like used by Stuxnet, are still probably going to work on OT networks. Um, or stuff like DLS search order hijacking, which means that the software that OT vendors design, um, it's not designed with, it's, sometimes it is, but it's usually not designed with security measurements inside. So stuff like hijacking the DLLs is going to work there. Um, so that's first vector. Uh, another vector would be some external engineering laptop. Engineers are the guys that are programming the controllers, that are writing the ladder logic, um, and programming the devices themselves. And sometimes they're using their IT laptops, laptops they bring from home. Sometimes these are external contractors that do programming for OT networks. And it's enough to get their laptop infected. You even can spearfish them and make sure they get the network into the OT. And of course, it will be, uh, it, it's another attack vector can infect the network. Um, we, we have seen we, we have seen some engineers being infected. It's usually because uh, besides doing their programming using these laptops, they're doing other activities on their laptops and getting a lot of malware. Um, okay, so another another attack vector would be okay. That's that's an interesting one. Um, during, I think, the, the last year, uh, we have seen the NotPetya, uh, NotPetya malware, and it was distributed by a malicious update. Um, someone hacked 
the uh, the guys from Amidoc, which is the financial software, and it was distributed with some uh, some malware with it, and that's and also an attack vector into OT networks. Uh, most most of the vendors, OT vendors, don't sign in their software. Um, so yeah, NotPetya, uh, that's example. Dragonfly, which is uh, which is a, which is a group that attacks OT networks, did it before. They uh, concealed an Havex Trojan inside one of the um, OT software updates um, and pushed it and infected the, an OT network using it. And this, these are some of the vectors. There's like three vectors I described now. And the problem, think about it, it's it's a network that's not connected to the internet. You're getting in, in there. You're, tr you're collecting order reconnaissance data. How are you getting out of there? And probably you can wait for, wait for the laptop to come back. And if it's infected, talk with the malware there and just uh, throw all the data there. Or you can wait for the same or another USB to connect back. Um, but the problem with that, it's going to take a lot of time for it. It's going to expose your malware on the OT network for exposure of detection. And it's, it's possible, but it just takes a lot of time. So um, we decided to, to research into that specific topic and found some really cool way. So Gosha is going to show you now. Yeah. Um, we lost something? What we lost? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. Go for it. Can we get the presentation? Mm, <laughs> probably my fault. Mm -hmm. Maybe the cable here is not connected well. Embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, great. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, before uh, going uh, deep into our project, let's have a little introduction to ladder logic and PLCs. Uh, so PLCs are uh, PLCs are small embedded devices. Usually, they have some microprocessor like a power PC or a MIPS. Have some storage unit and a firmware that runs everything, and they'll usually have a bunch of inputs and outputs. And um, you can connect sensors and motors and other stuff to those inputs and outputs. And this way you can build some industrial process. Like for example, uh, making sure the water in a tank is at a certain temperature or uh, controlling a production line. How do you tell the PLC what to do? Uh, there is a special programming language. This programming language was designed to program PLCs to program an industrial uh, process. Um, how does it look? Well, here we have a simple example of a very small uh, program. And you have to imagine it's executed uh, from left to right. Imagine there is a current going from the left side and executing everything in its way. In this example, it will first encounter a condition, check if the state is indeed zero. In case it is, it will execute the blocks. In case it's not, it will stop there. So it's equivalent to the code you can see underneath. A typical project will contain a bunch of those lines. And by the way, they're called ranks. Okay, so in our research, we worked with a Siemens PLC, though we could have chosen any model or vendor. Siemens is not special in any way, in this uh, kind, in this regard. Uh, Siemens like uh, organizing their ladder logic into blocks. Uh, so a PLC will contain several blocks, each block with some part of the code. There are several types of blocks. First, there are the organizational blocks. Uh, this is somehow like the global code. All the organizational blocks are executed all the time, uh, one after another. Then there are the function blocks. Function blocks are just like same as functions. They're used to organize your code, to reuse the code, uh, normal stuff. And then there are the data blocks. It's where you store your variables, and later you can access them uh, from the organizational blocks. Great. Um, now, we mostly use organizational blocks in the research because they have this nice property that can, you can insert another organizational block to the PLC, and this organizational block will be executed in addition 
with the already existing organizational blocks on the PLC. So you sort of inject code, so the PLC will keep doing what it was doing and will perform your additional organizational block. Okay, uh, why did we choose to do this with ladder logic? What's special about it? Well, several reasons. First of all, detection. Ladder logic um, is not being examined by antiviruses. Antiviruses focus on normal executables that run on normal, uh, on normal operational systems. And uh, ladder logic is code that has been uploaded to the PLC and uh, no one really checks it. So if you upload a malicious code, no one will know. Uh, persistency, it's a nice way to survive reboots of the PLC. And uh, there were recently there was some researchers that showed you can do cool stuff except contro controlling an uh, industrial process with the PLC. Uh, even some vendors, they expose uh, more APIs uh, to the ladder logic and you can do some low level stuff like creating sockets and in raw data, which opens a whole new set of possibilities. Uh, some similar research from the past, uh, the Tempest paper published by the NSA that showed how you can leak data with electromagnetic emission. And a very cool research called System Bus Radio that FM encoded Mary Had a Little Lamp um, with some C program. Okay, so our setup. Uh, we used SDR Play 2, which is uh, the small box that uh, connects to an antenna on the one side and to a PC on the other side. And it basically lets your PC access the antenna. Then a, sm uh, a regular TV antenna, you, maybe you can even see it from uh, here. And um, the Siemens S7-1200 PLC with the default configuration. And again, we could have used any other vendor. Um, okay, so a high level overview of the scenario we're presenting. Uh, assume you have some PLC in some air gap network. So someone injects a uh, ladder logic that collects some information he's interested in stuff that David mentioned, like the ladder logics of other PLCs, and he collects this data, and now he wants to exfiltrate it. The network is air-gapped, so he uses our ladder logic to create uh, low radio frequencies by, with the CPU of the PLC and exfiltrate this data. Okay, so uh, to achieve that, we had to overcome some challenges. Uh, first, um, the frequency used the PLC. What do I mean? Every PC, every laptop in the room, it creates electromagnetic waves so if I walk around with an antenna here, I'll see a bunch of waves. Um, this, but the frequencies that are affected by the <coughs> laptop, uh, they may vary depending on the web, uh, laptop type, on the CPU type. So uh, the first challenge is to understand what frequencies are affected by your PLC. So to do that, we used console SDR. Uh, what do we see here? This is the output of console SDR. So the x-axis is the frequency, um, and the y-axis is the time. So basically you can see what frequency was strong at what time. So the uh, light lines represent frequency that were strong during the whole recording time. The black frequencies represent, uh, black arrays represent frequencies that were not strong. So to understand what frequencies are used by RPLC, we basically had to build this setup, um, an antenna pointing to a PLC, and start browsing the electromagnetic spectrum with console SDR, looking uh, for some kind of pattern. Meanwhile, we were uh, turning on and off the PLC, trying to see if this will affect, uh, if we will see some kind of pattern appearing and disappearing. So after uh, some time, uh, it took us some time, but eventually we found that our PLC affects frequencies in the range of 320 kilohertz to 400 kilohertz. Great, so now we know what frequencies are affected by the PLC. Our next challenge is to create change. Because to actually encode data, you can't encode it in a constant line, obviously. You need to be able to control it. You need to be able to uh, cause the PLC to affect different frequencies or create a stronger signal. You need to have some kind of change. And you need to have that change through the ladder logic. So to achieve that, we had the same setup. We had console SDR on. This time we had it pointed at uh, the relevant part of the spectrum. And now we started writing a bunch of different ladder logic programs, always looking at the screen, trying to see some kind of a pattern. So our first attempt was to perform some uh, mathematical calculations. We were multiplying numbers, doing mods, some trigonometric functions. This had no effect. We kept seeing the same, pat uh, the same frequencies all the time. 
Our next attempt was connect an Ethernet cable to the PLC. And this showed a change, but this is obviously not good because it requires physical access. But we saw that a change is possible. Um, next, we tried sending traffic. We were sending packets, receiving packets, uh, trying to see if this causes some kind of change, but this didn't work as well. What turned out to work is copying large buffers of memory. Uh, we wrote a letter logic. Um, basically, the PLC gives you a memcopy-like API, so you can give it one buffer and a destination buffer, and it would copy the buffer. So we saw that when we did that, there was this very nice shift in the frequencies. So every time you see a shift, it's because we were copying a buffer for one second, let's say, and um, the, frequency, the, the frequencies created by the PLCs would move. Great, so now we know what frequencies are relevant, and we know how to create a change, and we create this change through the ladder logic. Okay, so, yeah, so next we want to write an actual ladder logic that will encode data and send it. So first we had to decide what's a one and what's a zero, it really doesn't matter. Um, then we needed to create some kind of synchronization pattern. This pattern will later help us synchronize to the clock of the PLC. Then we had to send the data. Um, so this state machine represents our ladder logic. Um, the first it starts by initializing, then it sends the synchronizational sequence by sending a one and a zero for like 10 seconds, and then it simply goes over the buffer it wants to send, extracts the relevant bit, and sends it. Um, let's dive a little bit deeper. So the most basic part is the send bit part. Uh, assume you have some kind of uh, parameter called bit, and in case uh, you, <coughs> you want to send a one, you, uh, we perform the memcopy trick we saw previously. This creates this pattern um, where the frequencies shift. Um, if it's a zero, so we just prefer some calculations, it doesn't matter what. And this just leaves the frequencies at their usual place. Great, so now we can use this basic pattern to send uh, the sync frequency, uh, the sync, sync um, the synchronization pattern. So we just send one and a zero interchangeably for a certain amount of time, depending on the length of this sync pattern we want to create. Uh, to send an actual data bit, we simply extract the bit in the ladder logic and again use our send bit block to send it. Cool, so now we have our ladder logic. Now let's talk about the receiving side. Now it's important to remember that this is a one-way transmission. So you have no way of telling the PLC, it's okay, I received the data, or retransmit it, I didn't understand you. It's just the PLC always sends, and so he, he thinks that someone will receive it. Uh, okay. So first of all, um, this is again the output of console SDR, and you can see that the pattern created by the CPU is kind of repeated, and it's exactly the same. And it repeats itself at different frequencies. But uh, some of those frequencies are noisy. There is this constant noise that is always disturbing you, or a background noise that's making it hard to understand. This might be caused by some device nearby, or by um, another component on the PLC. And uh, if you move the PLC to a different place, the, the noise might be different. So you, you want to pick a good, nice frequency to work with, something clean without uh, noise. So um, to do that, we first think of this whole thing as an image. We forget it's a frequency. Uh, it's frequencies and time. We just think of it as an image. And then we use correlation. We take uh, a simple basic love block of a transition from a zero to one and we correlate it to the image. Now, uh, correlation will have this nice property that it will be stronger if the noise is um, weaker, if there is no noise. And it will be especially strong during a synchronization pattern, because a synchronization pattern controls the, uh, has the most of those transitions from zero to one. A great, so now we we can automatically detect the optimal frequency to work with. So now we have just one frequency, one pattern. Um, now, next, we want to take this pattern 
And again, think of it as an image. It's a two-dimensional image, and we want to transfer it into a one-dimensional array. Uh, eventually, we will want to distinguish between dark areas and light areas. So we, we need only one half of it because it contains all the information. And then we just average all the rows, and we remain with one number per row. And uh, this number is either small if it's a dark area or big if it's a light area. Now, now um, we're going to do a, another correlation, this time with a perfect one-dimensional signal. Um, this, this is the signal we would expect to see if there was no noise in the world. So um, this correlation will have two nice effects. First, it will help us detect the synchronization. So we will know we, we are working with the best frequency and everything is fine. Because in case it's just a data transmission, uh, we won't see as many bumps. So the, synchronization, the correlation will be lower. Um, and then the other effect is that it will tell us what's the perfect shift to put this perfect mask on the actual signal. Um, and we will know what is, how is the clock of the PLC uh, ticking, so we will be perfectly synchronized. We will know when a second in the PLC ends and the next second starts. Great, so now we're synchronized to the clock of the PLC, and um, what we do now is we simply receive the data. So now we just have to wait one second, uh, receive all the image that we saw on this optimal frequency, and just to make the decision whether it's a light or a dark area. Great, now uh, some statistics. Um, after finishing the projects, we played it, started to play around, see how far can we get the signal to work. And actually with our simple antenna, we saw that it works in up to one meter. Uh, obviously we didn't choose the perfect antenna for this uh, wavelengths. So this might actually even go further. Um, our bandwidth was one bit per second, um, but this could have been a way faster. Um, again, using just a better algorithm, maybe encoding the data in some way, or a better antenna. You can imagine that in a real life scenario, uh, there might be some exfiltration techniques where you mount a uh, an antenna on a drone or you use some portable antenna to get near the PLC. Uh, great, now uh, the demo. So is the demo working? <laughs> it's probably not. It never works uh, when yeah. it's live. So, so um, can you check if it's yeah. working? I can see that it's not working. We actually had some problem with the ground cable of the antenna, unfortunately. Um, we didn't think uh, it might be a problem. But we prepared a backup plan. Yeah, we have a video. <laughs> so if we can switch to the presentation. Oh, sorry. Second. Okay. Wait. Just press the play. Okay. Um, yeah, so here you can see the setup, the antenna on the one side, the PLC on the other side. Let's go back okay. a little bit. Yeah, so. Yeah, so this is obviously the antenna, a normal TV antenna. One computer is connected to it. And here is the air gap and uh, the PLC. Um, so the PLC will be executing our state machine that we saw previously. Um, and yeah, let's start. It's a close up on the PLC. Um, yeah, so this is the ladder logic we talked about. This is the programming environment of the PLC. Um, now it's a, just an easy way to tell the PLC what to transmit at the moment. You can create an HTML page on the PLC, then connect to it. And this is basically happening on the PLC, right? It's a computer connected directly to a PLC. 
and we we write this on the PLC. So PLC will be uh, sending our company's name now. Um, now we disconnect from the PLC. Very it's connected only to the power supply. And you can see the antenna. Um, here is the console SDR output. So th this is an actual transmission of data. You can see the, those shift caused by the mem copy and they encode some bits. And then you can see it coming on the other side. So yeah, that's a that's demonstration. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Okay. It's also we, yeah, <laughs> we have a few slides. So, it's last slide. Um, how do we detect it? I mean, um, we can start detecting uh, like. Uh, the crazy EM uh, transmissions over the devices in our factory. We can try uh, shield everything with EM shielding, but we think the most practical way would be detect um, the programming of the PLC over the network. It means if you have some uh, a product that uh, continuously monitors the network and looks for stuff like if someone uh, pushes new ladder logic to the PLC, um, which you didn't approve, or uh, suspicious traffic from the PLC, because if the PLC is doing the reconnaissance and starts scanning stuff, suddenly you have a PLC in your network that's scanning, it's probably weird. And if you have, of course, new devices on the network that just connected to the network and started doing stuff, it will probably be suspicious. And we think that's the best way to detect such attack. So, questions? There's, there should be a microphone passing here, so just raise your hand and you can ask a question. Hello, uh, congratulations, good presentation, no matter the live demo. Those devices should be EMC compliant, so uh, electromagnetic compatibility, they should pass tests and everything. Uh, I don't know if uh, this would affect, uh, in case it was a certified EMC device, perhaps this was a leaky uh, normal, uh, device. Have you tried uh, uh, doing something with a foil, uh, uh, aluminum foil around the device and detecting from the power lines or the data lines? That would be an alternative as well. The second is if you can program, affect the operation of the device using uh, the antenna setup. Thank you. Okay, so um, the first sensor, um, some devices should be shielded, but as you see, it's, it's a regular device. We didn't change anything. We didn't uh, disconnect any shield out of it. It's just the way it is. It's not shielded. And there are other vendors. Um, we, we did the tests on this one, um, but there's supposed to be other vendors that's not shielding it because, you know, it adds to the price and they sometimes prefer not to do it because for some t sometimes the regulation doesn't enforce them to do it. So it's not always done. And um, no, we didn't try to prevent it using shielding. Uh, it wasn't the purpose of the, of, the, of the research. And for your second question, um, we can't really say if it can be affected back. We didn't try it. I mean, um, I've, I, I don't think I've read a research that can affect it to back there, but I don't know, that's interesting. That might be the next research. Any more questions? Yes. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Just curious, did you run the program with a um, <clears throat> like a system running as well, and did it in affect that? So if you run at the a PLC with a, a, a defined program, did it in effect for the program and therefore the uh, outcome? Want to answer that? 
Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, we had some code being executed in parallel. The code, for example, the code that was extracting the bit that wants to be sent, he was extracting it all over and over again, uh, which is like a shift and a, a end operation. Um, apart from that, it's a good idea. Maybe we can check with more code, but there was some code running on the PLC while we were transmitting. What is meaning the patterns are big enough to show the difference between our patterns of transmission and the stuff that's running usually on the PLC? They are not running. They are not writing for a second to some memory buffer. So, any more questions? Yes. Yeah, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask whether is there any power surge or power changes during the leak itself? Um. Did we test it? Power. power surges during the leak. What is the power surge? Um, power, more power consumption. Ah. Uh, no, we didn't test it. It's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah but interesting question. Um, usually there's... Um, the thing with PLCs, they are usually working... Um, uh, they're working all the time. There's not... There's, they don't have modes such as... Uh, um, I'm talking about this specific PLC, maybe others does have, they don't have modes that reduce, for example, the power of the CPU. The CPU is always processing code, is always running, is always doing calculations, and maybe the, the memory chip generates more power, but the CPU shouldn't generate anymore. Um, did you check uh, what's the impact on the CPU utilization and was that detected when you were running these uh, scenarios? What do you mean CPU utilization? So the PLC CPU utilization, like uh, did you increase any of the... Uh... Oh, the percent. Yeah, it, as I said before, it shouldn't change because the CPU runs all the time. It's always processing inside uh, PLCs. They're always executing OB blocks, and when they are not executing OB blocks, they're executing something. So it's like we, um, we tried putting more calculations on the CPU. I mean, make the letter logic calculate more, and we didn't see any change. So it usually should stay the same, either it's running letter logic or not. Hi, thank you for this presentation. Have you tried with uh, others PLCs ne nearby? Because in industrial environments, normally there should be others. So uh, just to check if uh, it's more a uh, very theoretical one or very practical that can um, work because of the noise, for example. If there are also, uh, others PLCs, would they make same noise on the same frequencies or they would shift a little? or it would be uh, too much noise to detect this and perform this type of attack. Okay, do you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, um, I can say that we had, uh, see, uh, we had laptops nearby, um, and it's a good question. Uh, basically, you know, if, um, if the other PLC create, uh, affects a different set of frequencies, it, it should still work because they won't interfere each other. Um, but um, yeah, if it's if it's different frequencies, it shouldn't interfere, and we assume that we produce enough um, enough uh, sim. I mean, the pattern is uh, in in unique enough and unified to you know to disable other um, yeah. Well, you might be able uh, noises, noises. You might be able to overcome this algorithm-wise, you know. Um, so yeah. <laughs> um, so you you caused the um, the the effect while doing the mem copy. Did you analyze any of the other instructions to see if you, it would cause disturbances on? I mean, so we saw disturbances on all the different harmonics. Um, were you able to cause a, a disturbance on different harmonics? I'm just thinking if it, that's possible, then all of a sudden you've got a way of encoding more data because you can start doing different. Um, interactions using different instructions, and therefore you've just increased your bandwidth by maybe 10 100 to 300 percent. Yeah. That's a great question. Well, uh, I'm pretty so. 
Well, we did test uh, a bunch of other opcodes. As I showed, we tried to do mathematical calculations and like send in traffic and this had no effect or we didn't see the effect. But basically, once we saw something that works, we sort of went with it. Though it's a good idea, yeah. Obviously, if you can affect different frequencies, then you can transmit more data faster. And as I mentioned, again, uh, transmitting it really fast was not was not our objective. Uh, I'm sure we can, like one bit per second was just convenient for us, you know. It can obviously work uh, way faster. I would like to add also that maybe, um, um, maybe I should say it again, but um, what's producing the, the EM, the electromagnetic uh, effect, is um, um, it's because the CPU writes data to the memory chip, and once it passes on the bus, it, trans it transmits the infrequency. So the, the, the instructions themselves has no effect because they're inside the PLC and they're just running there, they're calculating something, but once you're talking with another chip in the, in the, on the board of the PLC, the, the electricity that passes there produces the EM frequency. Okay. Um, you said that uh, with your antenna uh, you could uh, read your data uh, from one meter length. Uh, do you have an idea how far you could uh, still be able to, to be on the on read uh, what you are emitting? Sorry, I didn't understand your question. Can you repeat it, please? Uh, you said that with the antenna that you used, you could uh, read uh, what you emit from one meter. Uh, is it possible, or do you have an idea of how far you can uh, be uh, with a better antenna uh, and uh, be, be able to still read uh, what you are emitting? So we didn't test a better antenna. We know for sure it works very good with one meter. And if you will see our antenna here, it's just something from the store, like a, the most regular antenna ever. So. Um, it's nothing, there's nothing here, it's just, you can take a coil and it will be the same as this antenna. So, um, we didn't test it, but we assume that better antenna, better results. I mean, if you are, if you have like satellite dish, like <laughs> 100 minutes long, you'll probably detect also from kilometers, but you know, um, that depends on the antenna. We didn't do it. I think there's a question there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that OT networks are very often outdated, right? And we all know it. And basically, we always recommend, hey, we're gonna, you have to update the newest version. But often it's not possible because it's hardware is tied to software or any other reason. Um, what would be the mitigation then? What would you say customers should do, basically, to protect the outdated software the best they can? So. Um, outdated software, usually it's not even possible to update them. There are controllers that don't even have updates for the vulnerabilities. And we think the best way is monitoring, uh, passive monitoring. These OT networks usually do critical uh, infrastructures, critical processes, and you don't want to execute like uh, uh, tools or scan the networks because these PLCs are also like, they can crash from, from regular stuff. So we think the best way is passive monitoring, um, like a span port or something, monitor everything, see what changes, and alert if there's something war wrong in the network. Does that answer the question? Great, thanks. Yes. Thank you. Um, if you say passive monitoring, that would um, mean that you have to understand all different protocols, um, say Modbus, Canvas, all this stuff, 30 different function calls in Modbus, uh, different ways of implementing this stuff because you have a, a whole bunch of different vendors doing the thing. And the critical thing is then, what does it mean monitoring? You have to baseline the stuff. So you have to get an understanding who talks to whom, how often, what protocols, what time, what data transfer rates, what protocol <laughs> function calls, and right. the whole yeah, bunch exactly of that. Exactly what we do. So, so. <laughs> and then the question is, is it that if, you, and you can hardly build a policy handwritten and maintained to, 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 you know, build up a policy based monitoring. You have to do some artificial intelligence kind of to figure out what's normal and what not, and, and then running against this. So is that something where the industry and CyberX is already 
at that kind of maturity state. So just to clarify, he's not working for us, <laughs> <laughs> if you wondered. But that's exactly what we do. Um, my team is responsible for the protocols. We're doing the reverse engineering for the proprietary protocols. We're building the DPI engines, the deep packet inspection engines. We're building the parsers. Um, some protocols have RFCs and they are documented online, but some of them don't, and that's what we do. We're reverse engineers. And yes, what, what a company does, it looks in the network, it baselines everything. Um, we, have, um, we have algorithms to detect if something goes wrong. We are, we are um, analyzing the behavior of your network, your standard behavior of the network, and if suddenly some new PLC starts scanning your network, we're going to alert and tell you, okay, the PLC is behaving not normally. Um, do you have something you want to add? I can just add that uh, you said that all the protocols are different, and but there, there is a lot of similarity between them. Like they all have a start PLC, stop PLC command. So um, yeah, so even a simple baseline is possible. Yes. And <laughs> yeah, I, I feel safe to say that. Oh, you ask also about machine learning. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one of the guys that uh, did the research, uh, his name is Tal. He's uh, a machine uh, learning researcher. Uh, he's doing his PhD uh, in Israel. He is a PhD student, and he's building for us. He has also an army experience. He was from the intelligence unit, and he's building uh, machine learning models for this kind of stuff, for the industrial protocols. He's designing models to detect anomalous behavior. And we have um, also cool features like we detect um, uh, anomalous behavior on protocols um, without any prior knowledge about them. So yeah, it's really cool. Um, any more questions? Great, thank you very much.